Parsons, acting coach from Hollywood, California, and you're listening to The Movie Raid Show. It's time for The Movie Raid, and tonight's victim is former actress and current acting coach, Crystal Carson, that played in several films, such as Killer Tomato Strikes Back. Who's that girl? Hello. Hello. So what have we been doing so far? All going good. How are you, Mike? I don't know yet. Okay. We'll get there. With you in a minute. Are you going to put me on hold again? No. Not this time. Not this time. <laughs> so what's going on? Well, I'm excited to be going to Atlanta pretty soon in June. I'm going to be teaching some classes there on audition technique for film and television. Atlanta, as you know, has become quite the hot spot for film and television in the last few years. A lot of actors are moving out that way to take advantage of the new industry and all the new opportunities, and I'm going out to kind of help them know how to be professional about it. And when it comes to teaching, does age, does it actually differ when it comes to that, or is it just dependent on how much you really want to be an actor? It depends on how much you really want to be an actor. However, there are certainly more roles in certain age ranges than there are in others. In terms of Acting-wise, uh, is self-reliance too risky right now to do that? Self-reliance. I think it's so important that you produce your own product. Uh, if you're not getting cast every minute, which who is, then you should be producing. All the big stars are producing, and now it's so affordable to do that anyone can, whether it's a webisode or just shooting something with your iPhone. I mean, there's been full entire brilliant movies shot on the iPhone. So there's no excuse to not be working. So I think there's no excuse not to be self-reliant. Then you can try to make money with that work. And if you sell it, great. That's more legitimacy. If you don't sell it, great. You've got more product to put on your demo reel to show people that you know what you're doing and that you're passionate and that you're always busy. So I think in any world, in any job, uh, in any capacity, you want to be self-reliant. You know, not being uh, having to rely on anyone uh, is your best bet almost always, right? Oh, yeah. And not necessarily the the whole uh, out with the old and with the new thing because that doesn't always work. I mean, you could still use the old and still make it all on top. Yeah, absolutely. You just it's icing on the cake. Well, when a, when a person goes into a role, as far as characterization goes, should should they use it as a reflection as themselves? Well, it filter through themselves, but we don't want to <laughs> lead people to believe that you just want to be yourself because this isn't your story. You want to be yourself with different imagined circumstances different circumstances, different relationships, clearly different environment and a different objective, and maybe not so clearly, you've lived through different history. So I have to look at the script and then make real for myself things that happened in my past that led me to the script. And that's the part of acting that I think um, the layperson is sort of unaware of. An actor has to invent and make up a whole life, and of course you don't have time to make up a whole life for yourself, but the most important pieces, like say maybe, uh, you know, 10 or 12 incidences in their life that happened that drove them to be the kind of person they are that wants the kind of thing that they want right now that we are in these different situations trying to get it from these different people. So it's more than the script when you're auditioning for something. You don't just read the script and go, oh, I can put myself in, you know, I grew up in Nebraska and then I wanted to be an actor and now I'll just put myself into this script and I'll use myself. No, uh, I use my sensibilities, but I say, well, what if I grew up in New York? I would have different values. I would have different things that I was concerned about. Well, what if I grew up with a single mother? So I have to take time to invent for myself what that felt like. It is inventing for myself. I put myself into it. So how Crystal react to growing up in New York with a single mother and, and the way I invent that might look different than the way Mike invents that. And so when we both approach the scenes in the script, we have our own take on it. So yeah, I'm using myself, but myself plus somebody else's history. Does that make sense? Indeed it does. Because some people would like use emotional reactions rather than physical reactions from what they've been through physically and use the emotion to form that character, either to make a whole new character or the one that is already assigned. Well, I think the physicality is so important. One of the things that we forget is that when you move physically, you communicate something. And whenever you're communicating something, there's emotional attachment to it. So if I have the thought, oh my gosh, I just remembered I left the dog outside. I hope the back gate is locked. I am physically going to react to that thought. I'll probably my, my spine will straighten up. My eyes might open a little bit wider. And that's going to give room for those emotions to come out without me showing you what I'm thinking or showing you what I'm feeling. Because I simply feel them. The physicality um, expresses it. 
So, yeah, it's all about your emotion and the body language that happens when you think thoughts that cause emotion. All those three things go together. The physicality, the intellectual, and the emotional. Do you think most actors worry more about the timing of what whichever moment they're going through to actually nail it you know, precisely in that moment? Actors do, particularly when they're auditioning, make the mistake of, trying to worry about what the producer wants and how they'll get hired. And so they start thinking about things like, how does it sound? What's the timing like? How does it look? What are they thinking of me? And the sad part about that is, that's directing. (laughs) Actors are supposed to be living the life of the character. And the character is not thinking about those things. The character is thinking about saving the dog's life who might have gotten out of the gate. And there's appropriate time for you to think like a director and to figure those things out. But then you have to let it go. Just like if the director walked up to you and said, okay, this has to be really paced up really quick. You can't try to deliver it paced up and quick because now you're just a puppet. You have to give yourself the organic reason why it's paced up and quick and then put yourself in the story and live inside that organic reason and hope it comes out paced up and quick. But auditioning actors sometimes never take that last step. They stay in the sort of, let me make sure it's paced up and quick. Let me make sure the timing is right. Let me make sure I do it the way they want it. And in the end, that's not the way they want it, just by default. Because they want you to live like the character and not like someone trying to please them. Two different things. Yeah, it, it, when it comes to that, it, there's less creativity as far as uh, forming that character because you're not really given as much time. You're not given much of anything other than a time from point A to point B as far as that goes because that's part of the, the director's job. Yeah, so you have to go with your gut. You just basically have to pace yourself when it comes between uh, as, as far as getting that character down, knowing what the character is. I've said this before, you know, know your character and make sure or at least get a general idea of what it's all about and then you can deliver, I mean take consideration what the director has to say but you don't have to like go full blown and it's like okay, step by step by step by step you don't have to go through all that and just just one go. Exactly. It's really important that you know where the character is coming from and who the character is. And, you know, how do they feel about being at this location? Oh, I'm at a church. Now let me move on. No. What does the church feel like? It feels differently to one person than it does to another. One person feels holy and sanctified. Another person feels like this is a false place of lies. So then you have to say, all right, well, what's this relationship? Oh, it's my dad. Okay, moving on. I know what a dad is. Well, no, it's not your very dad. This is a dad who abandoned you when you were four years old. What would that feel like? You know, there's all of these questions you have to ask yourself. So, yeah, once you know the character, then you're able to take direction from the director. Then you're able to deal with whatever sides they throw you. Sides are a piece of the script, a piece of the total script that you use to audition. And if you know the character, they can say, hey, I know we told you to work on this scene. We want you to do this scene for us now. And you're still going to be okay because you can just pick up the lines, look at them, and, and say them. But you know why the character's doing what they're doing. So you don't feel lost. And so the director, you know, setting up the scene, you have to set up the scene before he tells you, because that way you can get some general idea of where this character is going or what place he or she is going through, uh, emotionally, physically, wh- whatever. I mean, it depends right. wherever it's at. Exactly. And, you know, acting is collaborative. One of the things I love about it is that everybody's bringing their ideas and actors forget to bring anything. They show up with what the writer gave them, all these words. And they wait for the director to teach them the, the blocking and the tone. And the, then they wait for the other actor to hopefully give them the, the relationship. And it's baloney. <laughs> you have to show up having your own work done. And then you're a part, a valued part of the collaboration. And you can't just wait to book the part to do that. Because auditioning is not like a job interview where you show up and talk about what you would do or could do. Auditioning is doing it. It's doing the job. So every audition is an actual job. You go in and do it, and you just don't get paid for it. And hopefully you do the job so well that they ask you to do it again for money. (laughs) Yeah, money is always the big issue. It's like you want to make a certain amount of money by doing this, and you want these roles, you want these roles. But the problem is with that is finding the right role for one. You can't just accept a role, and it's going to end up looking really bad for you, and it's going to look bad for your career. Having a, a line of roles that you just rushed into and even if these are like low budget or whatever yeah you know but a lot of actors are are lucky to ever get to have to be that picky you know at first you just want to work and do everything you can to be your very best in whatever it is and then that turns you know and you have a certain team behind 
you once you've proven yourself and you have to learn to kind of grow up with your career as it grows up and learn to say no at some point. Yep. And sacrifice is a big thing if you're becoming an actor because you have to be able to do so much uh, in terms of really nailing a role. Like, you know, for example, changing your appearance in some ways, cutting off your hair to fit this character or uh, mm-hmm. go to uh, physical surgery to, to just to get this role. If it's if it's a you know a key role, you know, potential marketing as far as that goes. Mm-hmm. Definitely, there have been plenty of people who have changed their appearance physically uh, through surgery, not maybe for a specific role, but just to be actors because they feel like they have to look a certain way. I know that's true. And what you said about sacrifice, so true. I don't know if actors, young actors just choosing to do it for the first time understand the sacrifice that it takes because to really do it well, you have to put in your 10,000 hours, as they say, to get to be a master at it. The competition is really fierce and you have to always be training and always be keeping your body limber and ready to handle whatever career comes up. And when you get auditions, you have to rearrange your life. You have to be able to be wherever it is. A lot of times a callback is in a different state. The director's there. You have to fly yourself. And sometimes they'll fly you out. And, and sometimes younger actors, they won't fly them out. Like, no, you're working as a local. That's a typical thing in this environment and this economy with the shifting, as I said, of production to Atlanta and to Louisiana and to Canada and to the UK. And lots of times they'll say, yeah, you can have this smaller role, but you have to work as a local and you're going to have to fly yourself out just for the callback. We may not even hire you. You got to put yourself up. And then when you book the job, you have to figure out where you're going to stay and and deal with all of the, you know, eating and getting there and everything. We're not going to handle it for you. And yet, these young actors that are starting off are willing to make that sacrifice to lose money to book a role just so that they can start to get some traction. And look at the sacrifice from your family. Sometimes you're going to miss events with your family because you've got an audition or you've booked something and you might lose a, a, a paying job because you've got to go to this audition or you've booked something. And then there's the sacrifice when you take on the role of letting yourself go through horrific events so that you cry when the character does or, you know, painful things and like as you mentioned there's weight gain there's weight loss there's putting yourself into a pile of snakes you know something you may be afraid of or claustrophobia or whatever it is but you have to tackle these things for the sake of the character and so i think actors are such giving artists they sacrifice every step of the way in almost every element of of the work and wanting to do the work financially expensive it's expensive on your ego it's expensive to your emotions expensive to your family life it's costly to be an actor and i just honor the people who choose to do it to the nth degree it's definitely a long road and when it comes to to that point uh who then where why how and all that as that part of the job description because you have to have that or at least learn that ability to do that when it comes to acting to know your roles basically absolutely so it's a lot of learning and studying and working and putting in the time yeah and when it comes to changing appearance do you think sex appeal is actually becoming more in the way than helping i don't know that it's more uh, in the way it has some roles, some producers rather, feel that some roles need sex appeal when maybe there's a better actor um, who could do it more believably that isn't as good looking. Uh, and if they were willing to try that actor, they might be surprised at how little sex appeal matters to the overall production. But that's not the way of the world, you know? So it's interesting that there's, there's shows like Girls, um, that TV show that maybe didn't use the typical cast member <laughs> and the physical way that the girls looked might be a little different than what we're used to in the United States at least and and yet there's tremendous success for that show and that's got to be waking some people up. It's not entirely bad but it's, it's no. definitely useful when it comes to let's say infomercials or regular commercials or something like that but when it comes to film and and of course it works out with television shows depending on what it's catered to but when it comes to films you see nothing but a, uh, these attractive people, and, and it's more of a distraction in some ways than rather catering to the story or to the character itself. Yeah, I have to agree. Sometimes I think to myself, there's no way that girl has trouble getting boys. I'm really having trouble believing that she's so, you know, hooked on this guy and thinks she'll never get anyone else because look at her. 
and yet the whole character, you know, the whole story is about how no one wants her. I'm sorry. <laughs> yeah, they would. There's nothing wrong with having attractive uh, females in there, or you know, even males, or whatever. But it, it becomes to the point where that's all there ever is. It's like it almost seems like we are living in this perfect world where there's nothing but attractive people. Now there's yeah. there are great actors and actresses that have those, you know, pull it off very well. As of course, or pulling off the look, even if they don't even have to try. Yeah, I agree. I I know that it, uh, people are interested in looking at attractive people. That's just kind of our human, the way we've evolved. So I don't know how fast that will ever be changed because producers know if I put attractive people on my poster, more people are going to tune in to watch it. As much as we're bringing, you know, we're changing the face of, of film and television by having more ethnicity out there. They're all pretty ethnic, ethnic people too. <laughs> I don't know when it's going to change to where we don't see everybody looking a certain way. Yeah, and, and sometimes it's less is more in, in film. Yeah, and, and certainly you see the indie productions and things coming from outside the United States where you see more average-looking people um, cast. Oh, yeah, it seems like you see that more that in the independent realm than rather yeah. than these more big budgets or even semi-budgets. It, sometimes it really works out, and then other times it's just so distracting. It's like, you know, why is this even happening? So you can't take the film itself seriously because you got so many oh, so many attractive people. That's like, there's like, there's too many of it. Yeah. How do you think actors should market themselves to become more accomplished actors? Well, that's two different questions. How how should actors market themselves to become more accomplished actors? Um, I think, in my world, because becoming an accomplished actor isn't necessarily becoming a famous actor. Although, hopefully, the two go hand in hand. But I think you really have to, as an actor, have two different hats on. One of them is your business hat, the one that is your PR person and figures out how to market you and how to make sure that you as a product get seen and sold. And then there's the you that is the person that makes the product. And that is should not worry about the success of yourself at all. You really have to be divided. And that person has to really say, I'm going to learn how to be the best actor in the world. And I'm not going to care what anybody else thinks. I'm not going to do anything to please someone outside of myself. Everything I'm going to do is to please the script, is to please myself inside the character, and to go for the truth of what the character is going for in the circumstances, you know, the imagined circumstances. And as you get better and better and better at that, it's easier and easier to market yourself because the product is better. Well, yeah, you're making yourself a product, and if you're signed up to a company and they see you as a potential product uh, to make a really good product, then you've you've made yourself something more stand valuable, valuable and st- uh, stand outish. And uh, you know, if you keep it up like that, you'll you'll make it anywhere. I really believe that. You know, I, I definitely you have to have that business hat too, so that you're not doing all this beautiful acting in a, in a classroom somewhere and then locked in your basement. It has to get out there. But unless you're putting more effort into the product than you are the marketing. Ultimately, the marketing is going to be really hard, and if you do book something, it'll be the only one thing you get anyway. No one will want to touch you after that. So the better the product, the easier it is to market it. And so if people will really put their attention on being good, as you kind of just said, a lot of it will just fall into place as long as you don't lock yourself into a basement. Uh, do you think exactly. actors should attach themselves to companies, like even if it's you know, beneficial in some ways? Well, I don't think there's a general way to speak about that. What's right for one actor is wrong for another one. And what's right at one time in their life is wrong at another time in their life for the same actor. So I hesitate to really make a blanket statement. To the point where uh, it could be really well as far as money goes, but at the same time it's like, well, then you'll be restricted because some companies won't allow them to make other films with other people because they have a strict contract or strict co- policy for them. Yeah, yeah, you got benefits, you've got money, you and they'll cover anything else in between. But if you're like with a small budget company, you're free to do whatever. Or if you don't go with anybody, then you're just a freelancer. Yeah, and there's pros and cons to all of that. The lesson is have a good lawyer. <laughs> <laughs> Especially in this day and age. Yeah. And nonstop competition, not just with actors, but in between companies. It, you have to accept it either way. Yeah, it's funny. In a certain way, we're kind of returning to the old studio system. <laughs> Well, go ahead and plug in any uh, web addresses or any other projects that you might be related to or anything like that. Great. Uh, well, I would love people to check out my website at crystalcarson.com um, and check out what I'm doing with my company, Auditioning by Heart, where I'll be located and, and what my philosophy 
he is and all of that is there. And I am also going to be doing a web series um, that I will publish the information there because I'm not really sure what it all is yet called 5150. And 5150, as you know, is police code, I believe it is, for involuntary psychiatric hold. So it's a comedy about some crazy women and it should be a lot of fun. I haven't done any acting in a while, so I'm really excited to kind of get my feet wet again. I've got a lot of projects going on uh, that just aren't ready to be announced, so please check out crystalcarson.com and see what I've been up to or what I will be up to. I'll be going to Ireland and, and London soon. I've recently been to Vietnam where I taught four-day course on auditioning by heart, how to audition for film and television. As you know, the world is now our competition. Because of the internet, when you audition, you used to just come to Hollywood and audition against those here in Hollywood. Now, you can almost be anywhere in the world and send in your tape, and you're com competing with people from all over the world for every role there is. So God bless casting directors and the extra work they're going through, and I will be coming to wherever you are, showing you how to become a star. Well, there you go. That is former actress Crystal Carson and current acting coach.